Amen. So, when I was in my early 20s, I was about 23 or 24 years old, a friend of mine had uh, a work event where they had sponsored someone to do a triathlon, and that person couldn't do it, and they asked me, hey, could you step in and do it? And it was like two weeks notice, I'm like, yeah, that'll be no problem. I'm young, I'm fit, I'm in good shape, I'm a pretty good athlete. And so then I didn't do anything in the two weeks preceding to that um, triathlon. And then I made a really big mistake in like there was a, this was on a Sunday morning. So I was ambitious, y'all. I thought I'm going to do this triathlon Sunday morning and then I'm going to be at church at 10 a.m. and everything's going to be good. And the night before, there were some friends that I knew that were getting together, some that I knew from middle school, some, uh, some other friends that were friends of friends. And so I hadn't seen these people in a while. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go hang out with them for a little while. And I ended up being there till like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I had to be down at the lakefront in Illinois, at Michi- Lake Michigan, at 6 a.m. So I maybe got two hours of sleep. And, uh, of course... I didn't sleep much, so you know what I skipped that morning? I did not eat anything for breakfast that morning. So I got down to the lakefront, and they had all these tents, and they had all this stuff, and there was a new product out. It was called Emergency, and they were giving free samples out. So you guys know what Emergency is now, but this was like 17 years ago. It was just coming out, right? And so they gave me this emergency stuff, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? I haven't eaten anything. I haven't drank anything. Let me take this. So I put it in water, and I down it. And I'm like, all right, I'm good, we're good. This is in August, but I don't know if you know, Lake Michigan in August is still like 42 degrees. Like it's ridiculously cold. And um, when I was just out of high school, like I weighed like 140 pounds. Like I had no fat on me whatsoever. And that does not bode well for cold water. So we start the triathlon. It starts with the swimming. I get about a third of the way through the swimming, and I ain't swimming no more. They had to fish me out of the lake. They took me to the beach, and when I got to the beach, all that emergency that I had just drank was all over the beach. We've been going through a series called Through the Wilderness, and today we're going to talk about God's provision We're going to talk about the need for water, for food, and for rest. We're going to talk about how God provides those things for us because he has a journey for us to go on, and we can't make the journey if we don't go. I was trying to run a triathlon on nothing, and it did not go well. And when we try to do things ourselves, It does not go well. When we do not take the provisions that God has made available to us, it does not go well. And so we've been going through the book of Exodus, watching the children of Israel uh, flee Egypt and begin their journey through the wilderness. Uh, We said that uh, Paul talks about in in 1 Corinthians 10 that... um, they were, these things were recorded, they were written for our examples and for our instruction. So the purpose of examples and instructions is for us to see how easily Israel got distracted, right? Pastor Lee's talked about distractions last week. The point, the goal that we see every time Israel was doing something, God is faithful to them and then they get distracted and we get easily distracted so in the midst of God delivering them providing for them leading them to a permanent residence that was beyond anything they could ever hoped or imagined we find them murmuring complaining and longing for the life that they had before It's important for us to realize just how easily and how prone we are to the same type of behavior. It's not, it doesn't look the same always, but it's the basic rudiment, fundamental uh, idea that we all partake in complaining, getting distracted, and generally not doing things the way that God would have us to do them. 
So, Paul wrote to the letter in Corinth, but it was for the benefit of the church in Christ, right? So when he talks about that um, these things were written for our examples, he was writing to the church in Corinth, but he was writing to us by extension. He was giving us instruction. He was giving us something to hang our hat on, to say, look, this is why you should pay attention to it. And one of the things that led up to this was him talking about Christians' rights. Obsessed with them. We're too involved with what is good for me, what I'm entitled to, and that is particularly true for American Christians. It's not as true when you get outside of America, but it is definitely true for us. We have been raised to uh, think that our rights are our rights, and to infringe upon them is to infringe upon something that God has given us. And to a certain degree, I understand that, but as Christians, we are supposed to be willing to lay down our rights for the good of others. So today we're going to talk about God providing for His people. He, he will provide water, as we'll see. He will provide food, and He will provide rest. And these are three basic necessities for us. In Israel's journey, it was a physical one, right? We can watch. They were literally going somewhere. They had staffs in hand. Ours is a spiritual one. So for the most part, we are going to focus on the spiritual application of what happened to Israel so that we can apply it to our journey through the wilderness leading to the promised land that we call heaven. So that's the goal this morning. In light of that, we will look at um, chapter, the end of chapter 15 in Exodus, Exodus 15, 22 through 27. It says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink out of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which he had cast into the waters. The waters were made sweet. There he made unto them a statue and an ordinance, and there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do what is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elam. There were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. So, we're three days away from God delivering the people of Israel through the Red Sea from Egypt. We're three days removed. And this would be the first time that God would provide water for the children of Israel, but it wouldn't be the last time. So he's going to continually make water available to them. But I want us to see how quickly, just three days later, God delivered them, God rescued them. He literally split a sea in two for them to walk across, and they get here, and now they're worried about what they're going to drink. The God of Israel literally split the sea. And we're worried about where we're going to get water from. I was blown away by this, but at the same time, I had to think, you know what? I probably do the same thing. God moves miraculously in my life. He does something spectacular for me. He reveals something. And a couple of days later, the boat gets rocky. And I'm like, whoa, 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 God, what's going on? You, you, you done messed up, man. Like, you weren't paying attention. Did you just see what happened? Keep in mind, they had just got done singing the song of gratitude. Right? That's what Pastor Pat preached on last week. They just got done singing the song. It's uh, like the... the a skit about Bill Cosby and his kids when the kids ask for cake 
and he gave them cake and they were singing the song about how great dad is and dad is great. He feeds us a chocolate cake. And then mom comes down and sees them eating chocolate cake and he's like, what are you doing? And the kids are like, he did it. And he said, and the kids who were singing my praises were now calling me out. We do that. God showing himself faithful and the people immediately start to grumble and complain. And water, it's essential to life, right? How long can you go without water? Three to four days. Depending on the person. Some of us have more water in us than others. But three to four days without water and you will die. So was having water a legitimate concern? Yes. Absolutely it was a legitimate concern. And the water that they found was undrinkable. Like if they did drink it, they would get sick from it. That's what would happen. They would get like, we we call it these days dysentery. And at this time, you didn't live when you got dysentery. So you would, if you drank this water, you would die. If you don't drink the water, you're going to die. There's a problem. It needs a solution, right? It needs a solution. What is our reaction when we encounter trouble? When we face the hardship that we're coming to, it's, it's a matter of fact that we're going to face hardship. It, you're not going to live your entire life and never have anything difficult happen to you. You're going to have a loved one die. There's going to be a car accident. There's going to be sickness. There's going to be arguments. There's going to be layoffs of jobs. There's going to be economic problems. You name it, it is going to happen. It is absolute certainty that trouble is going to happen. So when it comes, what are you going to do? Are you going to do like the children of Israel and and grumble and complain? Or do we look for God for a solution? And notice what the solution was. God showed Moses a tree. Spiritually, we need water. It is our life source. And when the waters around us are bitter, we need to look to the tree that Christ was crucified on so that our waters can become sweet again. The tree was cast into the waters and it became sweet. The tree that Christ was crucified on is cast into the waters and they become sweet. Sweet, because when you have Jesus, you have everything. The bitterness of our life, they're cured. The problems we face, they find resolution. We are constantly drawing water from things in life that leave us thirsty. Actually, you know, uh, being thirsty is a modern-day colloquialism, right? You ever heard somebody being thirsty these days? Yeah. If you don't know what that is, come and talk to me after church. We'll talk about it. (laughs) We are too guilty of being involved with everything else. We're looking for solutions everywhere else except for where we're supposed to look for solutions. Is the fruit of our spiritual life being well watered what's the fruit of the fruit of the spirit so we we know what the fruit of the spirit is right love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness meekness right what happens when fruit is well watered it's abundant it's sweet it's full of flavor right What happens when the water isn't getting to the plant? You don't get much fruit on it, do you? And the fruit that you do get is smaller. It's not as tasty, right? That describes our spiritual life perfectly. When we don't have the water of Christ flowing into our heart, 
the spiritual fruit of love, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all of this, it is getting weak. It is getting less abundant. And the little bit of it that we have that people are supposed to be able to partake in doesn't taste the way that it's supposed to. Jesus said this in John chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. He says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into him everlasting life. So Christ is the source. You're struggling with joy. You're struggling with temperance. You're struggling with anything that we find in the list of the fruit of the Spirit. You're struggling with any of it. Check your water source. Something's amiss. You're not focused on Christ the way you're supposed to be. That's, that, that's true of every single person in here. There's no exception to that rule. We have to fix our eyes on Him. Otherwise, we're trying to do things under our own power. We're trying to find solutions that are outside of the purview of God, we think that, okay, well, God did this piece, now it's my turn to do this piece to make up for what he did. No, that's not the way that it works. And this is what God said to the people uh, of Israel in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown, Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that ye have gone far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain? Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through the land of the deserts, into the pits, through a land of drought and of shadow of death? through a land that no man passeth through and where no man dwelt. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they handled the law. They that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isle of Kittim, and see, and send under Keter, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for what doth not profit." Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out the, the, hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So, we're looking at Israel, we're like, man, they're crazy. They, they went after these other gods, they were prophesying by other people, they were doing all this other crazy stuff, and God is saying to us this morning, you're not much different, and let me explain to you why. Our gods may look differently, but they exist. Our God is the God of politics. Our God is the God of education. Our God is the God of fill in the blank and that's it. But what we're looking for is solutions that offer us what we're looking for other than Jesus and taking in that and then thinking that we're going to find satisfaction and we're never going to find satisfaction in those things. We're never going to get a country that is perfectly aligned for God's purposes. You're never going to get a political party that is perfectly aligned for God's purposes and is holy from top to bottom, that is righteous. You're only going to find it in the scriptures. You're only going to find it in Jesus. And it's only going to happen when he comes back. Amen. 
Our hope is not a better political system. And the reason why I'm talking to you about this this morning is election is a little over a month away now. It's a little over a month away, and I already see the nonsense that's occurring with people talking about this person and that person, and you're crazy if you do this, and if you believe that, then I don't want to be a part of you, and we're missing the point. We've lost sight of what's important to us. We've lost track of who Jesus is in our life, and we think that who the next president is matters more than who we put our faith in. And they might not be true of every single person in this room. I'm talking about the church universal. We have, as an evangelical believer, whatever term you want to put on it, we have traded the power of the Holy Spirit for political power. And it's wrong. We want the power of the courts, and we want the power of government. Every time they tried to give it to Jesus, he rejected it. Every single time. We cannot live by the power of the things of this world and then expect the power of God to flow through our life. It is impossible. It's incongruent. I'm not saying don't care about politics. I'm not saying don't vote. Vote. Please do. Everyone vote your conscience. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. But what I'm going to tell you is that it doesn't matter at the end of the day whether who the president is or even if we're a democracy anymore. We are still going to be the same Christians whether we have a president, a dictator, or nothing. It's complete anarchy. Our job is still the same. Our job is to point people to Christ. He's recalling his people to remembrance of everything that he did. The fruit of the Spirit isn't as abundant as it should be. The swirling chaos that we face in this country is just one example of how the fruit of the Spirit of the church has declined. One of the ways that we can notice this is just what we find the children of Israel doing in Exodus 16, 1 through 8. And they took their journey from Elam, and all of the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. And on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, and I will prove them whether they will walk in my law or no, and it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children at even, that ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of this morning, that ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings against the Lord, and what are we that ye murmur, murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So there's two things that I want to point out here. The first thing is, Israel remembered the past and they romanticized it. They thought, man, it was better back then. At least we had something to eat. At least we had a place to sleep. Everything was good. And it wasn't. We're about a month away from them getting rescued from Egypt where they were looking for an escape. But they forget and they remembered the past being better than it was. And we have a problem that we always remember the past being better than it actually was. You want to know what the truth is that for God's people? The future is always brighter and it's always better. And then the second thing. They said, 
the Lord heareth your murmurings against him. Now the Bible says specifically that they murmured against Moses and Aaron. But they said, your murmurings aren't with us, they're with the Lord. So the other thing that we do is we complain and murmur about leadership. One of the ways that we can know that the fruit of our life isn't right is you always have something negative to say about your leaders. And I'll say this, whatever complaint that you have is probably something that you see in yourself. Because when I complain, I'm usually complaining about things that I don't like in myself that I see in other people. So we have a problem. We are remembering the past better than it was, and we, and when I say we, I'm not talking about everyone in this room. I'm talking about the church as a whole, the universal church, not just Christian fellowship. But if the shoe fits, wear it. Where we complain against our leaders, and look, Moses and Aaron, they were not perfect. Moses killed a man. You guys remember that? That's why he fled Egypt. He killed a man. What about Aaron? We know at least one thing about Aaron that we can go, yeah, that dude was kind of messed up. He's the one that built the golden calf that they're going to worship that we're going to talk about in a few weeks. So, no, were they perfect? Did they have everything figured out? No, you could probably make rightful, true, accurate criticisms about Moses and Aaron. And you can probably make accurate, true criticisms about the leadership in this church, in the city, in the country, or whatever. You could probably look at me and say, Pastor, this is your problem, this is your problem, this is your problem. And I won't deny any negative thing that you can say about me. It is probably 100% true in some form or fashion at some times in my life. It's probably absolutely 100% spot on. But I'll tell you that you're probably dealing with the same thing. And it's not helping anything. And when you murmur against your leaders, all you're doing is creating discontentment and bitterness. It's not leading us into the next thing. And the Bible says you're not murmuring against them, you're murmuring against the Lord. That's what the Bible says. We can focus on the negative if you want to. Plenty to focus on. You can point all the flaws and problems, or you can spend your time going to prayer that God would deal with them and move them and use them as he sees fit. Exodus 16, verses 12 through 16. We've talked about water. Now let's talk about bread or food. I've got to hurry up. I'm running out of battery up here. Uh, Exodus 16, 12 through 16. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host. And when they, the dew that was lay up was gone, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as a hoar frost on the ground. And they were, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said unto one another, It is manna, for they knew wits not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. That is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, an omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man uh, for them which are in his tents." One of the amazing things about God, the thing that I'm very appreciative of, is that in the midst of their murmuring, in the midst of their complaining, in the midst of forgetting everything that he had done for them, he recognized the need, and he didn't go, well, because you're being little brats right now, you're going to have to sit on the sidelines and just deal with it. No, he's like, I'm going to fix it for you. I have a plan. I'm, I'm going to give you what you need, despite the fact that it, it was the equivalent of a, of a kid basically jumping up and down, give me, give me, give me, give me. 
Now, an omer is about two quarts. To give you an idea, two quarts is about an omer. So for every person that you had in your tent, you collected about two quarts of this manna to bring it in. In the evening, you would have quail to eat, and in the morning, you would gather up this manna, and you would make it, and they'd probably turn it in all kinds of stuff, manana souffle and like <laughs> manana bread and... Before you knew it, it was like manna again. I mean, they ate this stuff for 40 years. Y'all get upset about some like zucchini bread because you grew too much zucchini. 40 years. But what I want us to see here is that they didn't have to do anything to get this food. It was provided for them. You don't have to do anything to get your spiritual food. It is provided for you. We get to partake in it. We get to go gather it, but it's prepared for us. Christ prepared it for us. This is what he says in John chapter 6, verse 30 through 35. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? And what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from the heavens and giveth life unto the world. Then say they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Remember how the book of John starts? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then later on it says, and and the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. In other words, the Word of God is made flesh in Jesus, and the literal bread of God is made available to us. When we come to Him, we have the bread of life. When we partake in Him, we have all of the sustenance we need. Remember when Jesus was talking to the devil when he was being tempted and he said, make these stones into bread. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Church, if you starve to death, but you have Jesus, you won. I know it it doesn't feel that way. I know that if we, we, we look at our circumstances and we're feeling like we're missing out on everything else in life, this person's getting married, this person's having kids, this person's getting the promotion, this person's getting the new car, this person's getting this and that, and we're looking at them and going, man, I would love to just have a little bit of that. And I get it, I do. And I'm not saying don't go after it, I'm saying don't go after it in, in lieu of getting Jesus. Those things will leave you empty. They will leave you hollow. They will not sustain you. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. That's what Solomon's whole book was about, okay? Solomon, richest dude ever, was like, look, I've done everything. I've tried everything. I've done it to the hundredth degree that you'd ever be able to do it. You go and buy CDs. I buy the band, okay? You have gone and slept with a few people. Yeah, I slept with hundreds of people. And I'm telling you, it doesn't satisfy. He did it to a degree that we will never be able to understand. And he's saying, the end of it is to fear God and keep his commandments. We live by the word of God. We live by Jesus. He said he is the bread of life. And bread is just a general term. It means food. That's why when we say we're breaking bread together, you don't just show up and all you got is a loaf of bread for you to eat. Y'all invite me to break bread and all y'all got is bread, y'all ain't going to have me very long. You better have some meat. Get some chicken in there or something. I don't know. He is bread. He is water. He is everything. And in him we have life. The problem is is that we're filling ourselves up with junk. You know what the junk food is? The junk food is watching, binge watching TV. 
I heard somebody brag about they watched the whole series of that show 24 in a 24 hour period. And I thought, that's a whole lot of nothing you were doing. That's filling ourselves up with junk food. We suffer from malnutrition because we spend more time debating and researching the things of this world than we do trying to fill our souls with the goodness of God. I know some people that they can tell me all the bad things about the uh, opposing political figure, but can't tell me what God did for them this week. Most people tend to want to have what is easy, what is fast, instead of actually what is good for them. I've seen this so much so that when um, people start to crave what's not good for them. I've, I've been there, like you start to crave a double cheeseburger from McDonald's, and that, let me tell you, that's garbage, but man, it tastes so good. <laughs> it really does. Like, if you eat it too much, it starts to go, oh, I don't know. But the first time you get one after like six months of not eating one, it's like heaven, okay? And, but what we do is, is we take this, this experience and then we just, we keep feeding into it. We're, we're, we're chasing the same high that we got off the first thing, okay? And instead of allowing the nutrients of God to come into our life and make us strong for the journey that we're going to be on. It's like me trying to run that triathlon that I told you about. Like if I did even trying to do that on McDonald's was not going to go well for me. Okay. We like fast food. We like microwave food, but that's not what we have in Jesus. Um, it's just not, it's not always convenient to eat of the bread of life. It's not always convenient. Now, the things of this life are always convenient. They're always easy to find. They're prepackaged, ready to go. You just pull it off the shelf and eat it. But it will shorten your lifespan. Some of us here are trying to labor in the gospel without the food we need to do it. We've been accepting anything and everything else to sustain us except Jesus himself. Jesus has to be our daily bread, church. We have to be feeding on his work constantly. We can't live on the things of yesterday. And that's what we find the children of Israel doing. Verses 22 through 26 of Exodus 16. And it came to pass on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came unto Moses, and they said unto them, This is that what the Lord said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and see what you will see, and which remain of the overlay you will keep till morning. And when they laid it up till morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink. Um, so what we have here is... Two things that were occurring. So when you kept the food on the, to keep over for the Sabbath, when God was giving you rest, it didn't rot, it didn't get worms, it didn't stink. But when you tried to take, gather more than you needed and hold it over for tomorrow so that you didn't have to do anything that day, it would rot and it would have worms in it. When we try to do our way and live on the blessings of the food of yesterday, it spoils. God has something fresh for you today. Why do you want to try to feed on yesterday? We're supposed to remember it. We're not supposed to live off of it. Like I'm, I actually, one of the problems that I have at my house is I'm not a big leftover fan. So if we ate something uh, last night, if it's not pizza, it's probably not going to get eaten again. I'll eat cold pizza for breakfast, but uh, some about fried chicken doesn't warm up well. It just doesn't. 
So we have water, we have food, we know that we need to live on the blessings of today, not the blessings of yesterday. We need to partake in the food for today. Give us this day our daily bread, right? But our bodies need rest. And like I said, we're going to mainly focus on the spiritual context of this, but as we go into it, I want you to hear me on this. If you don't rest your body, your body will make you rest. God created the Sabbath for a reason. We're not under law to keep it on Saturday like Israel was, but if you don't rest, your body is going to pay the price, and you're not going to be as effective as you could be if you don't find that time to rest. So I wanted to get that out there as we talk about this, because we're going to talk about rest in the spiritual sense, but we need to rest in the physical sense too. So Exodus 16, 28 through 30, and the Lord said unto Moses, how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Very often, and particularly for us in this country, we equate busyness to productivity. And the two are not mutually intertwined. They, sometimes you can be busy and have a lot of productivity, but most of the time what happens is, is the quality of your work suffers when you become really busy. You do a lot of things mediocre. You don't do anything well. And we feel the need to stay busy. In fact, um, we're built on a system that basically rewards you being busy all the time. Have you ever noticed when you, how you feel when you don't get enough rest, though? Have you ever felt like just like the brain fog? The feeling like if I sit down and close my eyes for even five seconds, I'm going to be out like a light. Have you ever felt that kind of tiredness? Have you ever felt the, the not just the like, the tiredness of, man, I, I got to sleep for a little while, but the, like, I could sleep for like a month and I would still be tired? What happens when you're like that? Do you make really good decisions most of the time? How about your emotions? How are your emotions feeling then? I know for me, when I'm really tired, what happens is, is things that are mildly funny become really funny. Things that mildly irritate me, all of a sudden I want to choke you because you're doing it. And the things that would make me, oh, that's too bad, make me want to cry. Okay? I get grumpy when I'm tired. You can ask my wife, she'll attest to it. And she, she's probably shouting amen in our living room right now. Um, I think we are spiritually burnt out as a nation. I think that we live in a 24-7 news cycle uh, with news across the globe and a nonstop stream of information that our soul was never designed to take. You know, when Jesus ministered from city to city, we read the scriptures and we see him. He's ministering in this town, and then all of a sudden he's in the next town and he's ministering there. But guess what happened between that city and that city? There was a journey. There was a walk. It took time. So even the Son of God wasn't always going, 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 going. And we think we can just keep going like we're the Energizer Bunny. We are overloading ourselves with the cares of this life. And I don't know about you, but when I hear about all the stuff that's going on, like I, I hear about the earthquake over here and the wildfires over there and the killing of Christians in that country and the, this going on over there. and Like it's just everywhere, right? Like you can turn on the news and find something wrong somewhere. There's always something to be concerned about. And in the day of coronavirus, it seems like every day we're like, 
yo, what is going on? We're not designed to be that way. We need to take rest. And Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 28, I mean chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. He says, Come unto ye, unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here's the deal, church. We have to find rest. We have to find ways to turn everything off and just spend some time in him. You're not designed to fix all of the problems of this world. You are not designed to be overloaded the way that we are. You're not. I was reading a book recently, and they were talking about how really about 150 people is about the most that we have capacity to keep any type of connection and care for at any given time. You start getting beyond that, and it becomes overwhelming to people. You can have acquaintances, you can know people, but the truth is, is once you get past 150, you're not really having meaningful, impactful relationships with those people. And, and that's, that's even stretching it really far, okay? That's like the highest capacity. And again, like even at 150, you're not having deep, everyday relationship with those people. And so what we have here is we have a society that is constantly bombarding us with stuff, constantly keeping our mind preoccupied. And God is saying, just peace. Come to me. Let me deal with those things. I got the wildfires out in California. I got the Christians that are being killed in India and um, Iraq and Afghanistan. I got that. I, I got the, you know, we, we've had more hurricanes this year than I can count. Like we were already on the, are we on? No, we're past Rita. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're past the regular, like we've already, already gone to Z. We're past it. Like, and to give you an idea, like when hurricane Katrina hit a few years ago, that was in September and we're way past the K's, okay? <laughs> There's a lot that we could be taken in. There's a lot that we could be worried about. And then everybody is telling you that the cause that they're for is the most important thing that's going on right now. If you don't do this, we're going to lose our country. If you don't do that, this is going to happen. If you don't give money to this cause, these people are going to go hungry. We can't do everything. What we have to do is allow Jesus to focus our hearts on what he has called us to do. And allow ourselves the rest of just being in him. My wife and I were at a uh, marriage retreat a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things, and I, I'm going to help you ladies out because this blew my wife's mind. She couldn't believe this is 100% true, but it is actually 100% scientifically proven to be true that men have this thing called the nothing box, okay? And we will sit down and we will think about nothing. I mean nothing. Like, no, no, you're, you're thinking about the bills, you're thinking about it. No, 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 I'm thinking about nothing, and then you, you go up to your husband or your boyfriend and you're like, hey, what are you thinking about? Nothing. nothing. And you're like, no, you, that can't be true. <laughs> but they've done studies. Like literally they've put men and women in a room. They put the electrodes on their head and they just let them sit there. And then after a while, the little wave reading that's on the brain will just go... And the longer women sat there, it would go. <laughs> we need to open up our nothing box, church, and just let the Spirit of God deal with us, okay? 
all of that stuff that you're worried about, all that stuff that you're caring about, it might be important, but guess what? God didn't design you to fix everything, Todd. Jay, you're not responsible for all the world's problems. Byram is. I'm just joking, Byram. I wouldn't put that on you, brother. So, what my prayer for us is this morning, as I wrap this up, bring the plane in for a landing, is that we would cut out the distractions, that we would deny ourselves the things that keep us from being the Christian that we should be. Okay? So it isn't that God uh, can't use you despite whatever circumstances you are, but as He grows you, as He matures you, you should grow in your spiritual food. In, like, one of the things that when I was a kid, I hated drinking water. Give me plain water, and I'm like, ew, gross. Where's the sweet tea? Where's the Coke? I mean, my grandmother, when I was a, a toddler, she would take Coke and pour it in there and then pour it in with water and then shake it up to get the fizz out and give it to me. So it's not completely my fault. I blame my grandmother, but uh, give me Coke, give me sweet tea, give me something with flavor in it, right? But that, that stuff, that doesn't sustain you. Actually, it dries you out. It makes you so that you need more water. And as I've grown up, I would much prefer having like a really nice home-cooked meal than fast food, by far. So as we mature in Christ, that's what should be happening to us as well. We desire less and less of the junk around us. We want the pure living water, and then we find our rest in Him. Because let me tell you, church, it, whatever concerns that you have about this country, the election, the coronavirus, whatever thing that we need, God has already given us provision for it. And the provision is Christ. He's come down, and if we keep our focus on Him, if we allow Him to move and work in us, and we feed on Him, we drink on Him, and we rest in Him, we will have the energy to do all that He's called us to do in this wilderness. Amen? So as we uh, wrap up tonight, uh, this morning, that's the end of the sermon. Um, I, I want to...